All right, so we, we figured out the light timer is working awesomely. It's you mind clicking the... <clears throat> oh. <laughs> the light timer beat you. All right, so welcome to the Silicon Valley JavaFX user group. Um, so we meet about monthly to talk about different JavaFX topics. Today we have Philippe Heydrich. Is that you say your last name? Yep. To talk to us about JavaFX text rendering. So we're very excited by that. Um, we even have a special, a special guest who's photographing me from the back of the room from, from India, the user group leader of Jug Chennai. Get a picture of Raj there. User group leader of, of Jug Chennai. Actually, just come up here, Raj. This way you can speak into the mic. Otherwise, they can't hear you. Come on. You're, you're, you're our special guest of the, of the evening, besides, besides Philippe. Thank you. <laughs> so our user group leader of Jug Chennai and also um, the new code jug leader of Jug Hyderabad. Yeah, so say a few words, Raj. Uh, thank you so much for me uh, to coming here. Um, it's the first time in this jug to participate, and uh, I like Java FX even more. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Thanks very much, Raj. Um, some of our sponsors are Oracle, provides the, the room, which we almost didn't have tonight, and the, the food, because we couldn't locate it mostly. Um, Linode provides hosting for some of our sites. Um, JFrog pays our meetup fees. Um, what other sponsors do we have, Keith? I don't know. IntelliJ. IntelliJ. Oh, yeah, we'll give a free IntelliJ license out to a, a lucky Jug member as well. Um, and find some equitable, get, equitable way to give it out. Maybe you'll come up with a good trivia question. Hmm. Um, for folks watching online, we're broadcasting and streaming live at nighthacking.com and also the Silicon Valley JavaFX user group webpage on Ustream. Um, so if you'd like to interact with us online, you can tweet questions. Um, just put hashtag nighthacking, and I'll be following the Twitter chat. You can also interact on... Um, what do, what do we recommend people use for chat now? The, probably the Ustream chat, the Silicon Valley JavaFX user group Ustream chat. So if you go to the SV JugFX Ustream site, then there's a live chat. You can interact with other members and talk behind the presenter. It's back. Um, and I'll be monitoring that from another laptop as well. OK, so with that, let me turn it over to our, our featured presenter. So <laughs> all yours, Philippe. Okay, um, let me introduce myself. My name is Felipe Heidrich. I work um, for Oracle in the Java graphics library. Uh, I work a lot with the text, but um, over, over the years, I have worked pretty much in every part of the toolkit. Uh, today, I'll be talking about text, about the change that really happened about one year ago in uh, a lot of our users are very, um, sensitive when it goes to text and something very critical that when you change you're always going to please some people but not everybody and you're going to talk about what that happens why you just cannot have text to make everybody happy uh, and uh, it's not my fault uh, i'm going to try to prove that to you along this talk uh, is uh, my um, okay let me start the the slides over there so they're just the title there uh, okay, so let's not get too far ahead. Uh, that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, I will talk very little about the text node. It's really the text primitive in JavaFX. It's how you render text. You don't have a graph context where you set properties and you call draw text. You have a text node, and that's your draw text. So I will just mention quickly what you can do with that. And then I'm going to move on into the rendering. What are the, the how you can analyze the quality of your text? Uh, then I'm going to talk about a little bit about the implementation that we start when in the first release of JavaFX, uh, followed by how did that change last year, and uh, a final thoughts at the end of the presentation. So. Uh, what I'm saying there, that's actually a sentence from Robert Brandhurst. He's a designer. 
if you ever watch a movie called Helvetica, you're gonna he was one of the designers that are featuring that movie. He's a uh, well known in the in, in that field. Uh, and what he says there is space in typography is like time in music. In the oh indefinitely divisible but a few proportional intervals can be much more useful than a limitless choice of arbitrary quantities. I, I think what I want to bring to you with that sense is the designer when he's uh, designing his font face they will put a lot of love in each curve and each little spacing that you that makes that font face. And they will spend literally hours and hours in each glyph to make that look just right. And what you're going to see along this presentation is that, okay, the guy went there and designed this beautiful glyph. The space between this glyph has perfect harmony and looks awesome. But when it comes down to render that, you just cannot do it because you don't have enough pixels in a screen to do that work. So over the years, people uh, came up with different workarounds and solutions to make that more tolerable. Cannot be done technically like. Theoretically, you just cannot nail that right on. Your eye is going to have to fudge a little bit here and there, and your eye is going to compromise something, right? When you go to talk about print material, when you run your text through a printer, you don't have that problem. Printers have very high DPI compared to the screen. A any printer there has 600 DPIs or more. Uh, but on the screen, is a, a lot harder. I will just try to without going into too many details, just to give a little introduction to you what those problems are and what are the solutions that uh, had been in the work since the 1980s um, and how th that is evolving with you know, higher resolution uh, monitors that you have today. But keep in mind, like when it goes to compromise the designer, someone is going to be sad. You know, someone spent hours to make that look that way and you're going to distort the outline so you can render and you don't have a choice. Um, so now you're going to, oh, okay, I went ahead again, but uh, the, if you ever work with uh, JavaFX, eventually you have to do some text. Um, the best way to look at the text node, you, you, you really got to look at the, the subclasses, the superclasses, I mean. First of all, a text is a node. And as a node, it can um, handle events. So all the mouse and key events can actually be captured by any text node. It uh, takes part in the layout. Uh, the width and the height are defined by the text and the font itself. But how you lay out that within your layout is controlled as you would control any other node. It can be transformed. So you can scale the text, you can rotate the text. Uh, any fine transformation you can really apply. Uh, 3D transformations are not going to do anything good to you. That said, when you're transforming text, you got to be extra careful, okay? Uh, especially for the work of LCD text or um, even grayscale text. If you just draw a text in 12 points and uh, you scale three times, you're better off not doing the scale. You're better off just Render that at 36 is a huge difference. Um, I will go back to that at the end with that final considerations. If you are translating it, uh, because it's a node, nodes also have a property that is to, to cache as a bitmap, and you can also hint that, uh, that bitmap. And you can conserve the cache if you are translating or scaling or doing other affine transform. But bottom line is, when, when you're going to transform your text, you're going to have to think about what you're doing. Just be careful about it. And another thing that uh, you can do, as any other node, you can apply effects. We have a lot of uh, ready-to-go effects. Drop shadows, inner shadow, reflections, blur, sepia. Um, take a look at the entire library. Another thing that's interesting to do in effects, and I don't see a lot of people doing it, um, you can actually, well, you can only set one single effect in JavaFX. Set effect takes just one. But uh, what you can do, and what that uh, picture shows you here, the text that's up there for you, 
is that you can blend one fact into another fact. There is a blend that you can you can get uh, uh, over here. I think I have maybe four, three, four, maybe five different drop shadows. I have a drop shadow that is orange, then a little yellow, 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 and I just blend with source over one top of the other, and that final blend is my final effect. Uh, likewise, I could have thrown in something else in my chain of effects and compose something that is actually more powerful than you, than, than you thought originally. Um, the next one down, so you have text, the subclass of shape, which sub sub shapes the subclass of node. We talked about node. Uh, what shape gives you? So when you're rendering your text, the normal mode is fill. You fill the outline. And that's where you're going to have your usual grayscale and your usual LCD. But you can set the color or the paint to be transparent, the color transparent, and you can just stroke the text. And the stroke is going to draw as a path. So it's going to, in terms of uh, rasterization, we're going to use our path rasterizer to take care of that for you. So, so there will be a different code path running underneath the scenes, but we will take care of the Either if you're feeling or stroking the outline, we make sure those things, they, they match nicely. And because you, you take a paint when you're specifying your stroke or fill, you're not limited to a color. You can use an image pattern. You can use a linear gradient or um, a radial gradient. And what else have in there? I think those are the three main ones, right? Gradients image patterns, and colors. Uh, and you have four channels and every color in JavaFX alpha. So yeah, I'm have right over there. And we have all the, I didn't, li I, I didn't go there and list all the at attributes that you have available to you. I, I guess I got the, the one that the more attractive ones. But uh, go there, take a look in the Java doc, take a look in the public API. Know the public API for node, shape, and text. So you know all, all the things you can do. Uh, stroke properties include the usual. You can dash. You can have a width, your line cap, your line joins, um, whichever. So I'm going to move on to the next one. And now when you're done in text, you already had all that good stuff. Down in text, you're going to obviously have the font, right? the text itself. Font is moving which for us, we support grayscale and LCD text. One that could be missing, one could claim that we're missing is black and white. We don't do black and white text. We support line breaking, we support text alignment, underline, strike out. We have a few more properties about how you want your uh, bounds to be computed. If you want to compute the ink, the black box of the text, or if you want a logical bounds, um, the black box is really where the paint touches. The logical bounds is really your ascent and descent is the properties that you, you have in your font. Um, goes without saying, we, um, I think it ver as of version 2.2, we support a full range of Unicode characters. We support Baidai text, we support Japanese, we support self-index scripts, we support all of them. Um, of course, you're going to be limit, limited by our layout engine. I can, this talk, we are not really talking about the layout of text. Of, that is the process of getting your cars and getting your glyphs. Like we have libraries like Half Bus or ICU, do that kind of work. Well, I'm not really focusing on that, but I think it's worth to tell you that uh, you got the Unicode support, including by the eye, like, which is Hebrew, uh, bi directional text for. Uh, Hebrew, Arabic, and Urdu scripts that are probably the most popular ones in Baidai. So, uh, okay, so that was just introduction so you know what things are available to you in the text node. Now I'm going to go back and talk about the rendering of text and um, how we can judge why it is that uh, we can just get precisely what the font designer wanted. We just couldn't do that. And, and what are the ways to compromise? What are the ways to make the error of rendering text more tolerable? And tolerable it is 
personal. What is tolerable to me, how I'm going to compromise that might be okay for me, but not for everybody. Um, as we move along, we're going to see that Windows and uh, Apple, they took different approaches. So that's where you see more of uh, diversion, like, well, Windows guys, they like the text to be hinted in um, a higher contrast that you get by using those techniques. Mac, they don't hint the text at all. They ignore hinting in the font, and they just make the text a little thicker to compensate by the contrast, and they just apply subpixel rendering. Uh, so I'm going to talk about fonts moving, subpixel rendering, subpixel positioning, and hinting. Um, I'm going to talk about those concepts in generally, it's just like talk about text rendering. Whatever library you're using, you might want to, to know what those are so you know what, what you are getting from those libraries. Uh, so I'm not really talking about JavaFX particularly here. I will go back to JavaFX and I'm going to tell you what, how JavaFX, wh what rules they're gonna, we're going to follow in JavaFX. So, um, first of all, I have two images there, right? One is just a sim very simple diagonal line. You don't think of that as a, a glyph or a letter, maybe italic L, doesn't really matter. The point there is that I have outline and I have a pixel grid. And that's the nature of the rendering, right? So when I look at that, the center of each pixel is either within my, my shape or outside. If it is inside, it's black. If it's outside, it's white, right? So it's a simple concept and just intersection there, do the math, figure out is, is that little circle within or is out, and, and you get the, the little ladder effect that you call alias, right? And it, you can make text look really bad if you just have alias text without any hinting or anything. Uh, things are going to disappear. Um, is is a lot harder. If you even go for fun today, tonight, and decide to implement yourself a la line draw algorithm, go for it. And you're gonna see that as you as you change your control points, your line is gonna disappear. Right? It's because that, that this concept is just too simple and not gonna just work. So the next step in here is a uh, grayscale. So right now we start to do some uh, fonts moving. You try to make those lines look a little bit more pleasant to you. So what I'm going to do here, for each pixel, I'm going to oversample that pixel. I'm going to divide that pixel into four, or two by two. Uh, uh, real code, we're going to divide that much, much more than that. We're going to divide probably eight by eight, maybe 16 by 16. Uh, yes. So we have a more of uh, shades of, of gray, right? And so I'm going to oversample my pixel, and then I'm going to downsample to calculate my color. So if you look there on the top, I don't have my mouse here. I cannot show you that. But if you look at the top right guy, it's uh, all four centers are within my, my, my outline. So it's going to be fully black. The next one down has only two of the centers within my shape. So that's going to be 50% black. Uh, eventually, you're going to have a, a few scenarios. You have one guy inside, two guys inside, three guys inside, all four inside. So right there, you got yourself five shades of gray, ranging from white to full black, right? So you already got a little bit of this guy is almost within your outline. Um, so if you if you go four by four, then you're going to have 17 shades of gray, 26, seven, uh, 20. Five shades of gray. 16 by 16 is going to give you 257, right? 16 times 16 plus 1 for the white. And that's an interesting number because the size of a byte, take one, right? Um, obviously, you need to do more computation to calculate your, your gray, uh, but it's going to look a lot better just there. Um, next one over is uh, if you look at the pixel. And you, and you look at your hardware, and if you have an LCD monitor, which a lot of is what you got a lot of the time, most of the time nowadays, um, each pixel can be divided in three, and um, the, the RGB. So you can think of, so the, the same 
the same idea that I applied before, you can apply again, but to calculate each one of the subcomponents of your pixel. So what you did, at least across the X, you were able to triple your number of pixels. And that's very interesting. You know, uh, and that's what LCD text does. Um, so it, you will start making those contours and lines a lot more smooth, and they start to look a lot better. That said, it's not without limitations. You know, um, first of all, if uh, at the end, I, I have some other pictures at the end. At the end, so what we're going to do is going to calculate the red, the green, and the blue. So w what you really end at the end is not those nice shades of brown and bluish. You end up with some really ugly red, yellows, and greens, and blues. So after you do this, the, the downsampling of your, uh, of your uh, sample, you're going to have to run a filter, which is a, a clear type filter, or sometimes referred to LCD filters, to make those color fringes to go away. And that's where a lot of people get picky, because they don't like to see those colors in there. But they are, they are part of the nature of LCD. They w as long as you have LCD, you have that. Another problem is that it washes off your text a little bit. Uh, if you're just implementing the code and you know you just draw a vertical line on the center of the pixel, that line is going to be fully black against a white background. Let's suppose you have a white background, you draw a line from uh, X1 one, one to 110. So you, you want to see black and white. You don't want to see gray. You want to be in the center of the pixel. So you draw at 1.5 and 1.5. If you draw that and you have an uh, LCD filter going on there, you're not going to get black. You're going to get something that's um, a little bit orange, a little bit gray, a little bit blue. And it's really washed off. And the, 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 the truth is, you lost contrast. And when you lost contrast, you make it harder to read. So what happens to, to solve that, what you're going to have to do, you're going to have to make your stroke a little bit thicker. That one line that width that you that you want it is not going to cut it with LCD. So before you see any black in LCD, you need at least one pixel and I believe two thirds. So pretty much you need two pixels. So you need to make the text a little bit thicker, like the text that you see on Mac. On Windows, you can get away by hinting the font so that your, your contours and your lines start falling within the grid. So you don't, you don't need to have so much of that thickness coming on. You can have like a nice contrast and still have a little skinnier text. Um, another problem that happen there, well, if you don't have LCD monitor, if you have CRT, forget about it. Or if you have, uh, or, or the pixel geometry of your hardware is not RGB or a BGR or something else, or like OLD, that some bizarre geometries. Or you have a tablet and you rotate or you have your monitor and you put your monitor standing vertically, vertically, right? Uh, or that doesn't matter anymore. And on the Y, you're not doing anything. So usually when you talk about LCD text, sometimes you talk about the hybrid sub-pixel rendering, which that means that they're going to do LCD across the X and grayscale on the Y. Um, or they do black and white against the Y. And that starts to be noticeable if you have a large text. So if you have a large text with a big O and you have that little turn of the O, you're going to start seeing that it doesn't look very nice. And if you inspect closely, you're going to see that th there is nothing in the Y, and now you're having the little ladder happening again. And the LCD doesn't make that go away. You wouldn't have to have a hybrid rendering there that would do a grayscale across the Y for you. Um, that can be done with direct write. I don't think Windows did that for GDI. So it's something that you people on Windows live with that. Um, and there is um, another problem when you are um, rendering text. That's a hard one to. If you start scaling your text, you start increasing your font size. It does not scale linearly. So if you have a font 12 and a font 24, you're going to assume that they're going to be twice the size precisely. You think the lines are going to wrap right in the middle point? No, it doesn't. 
because the things, I, I always fudge a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right. And one of the main reasons for that is because they round. So they, you can compute your, your glyph advances using uh, float numbers, but when it comes to the time to snap, to snatch that pixel into the screen, it just rounds it. So if you, you know, if you're rounding numbers, it's no longer linear. You know, like the it, it thing is always going to fudge a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right. Uh, I might be able to show you that if a little tool I have. Uh, in, in some of the first, for, for a long time, that's what JavaFX did for all the grayscale text. Every time you go to render grayscale text, on the last minute, that 2.75 becomes two, uh, becomes three. So if you double that, the, the things are not going to be in the same position. Especially visible if you're uh, transforming text or scaling text or even translating text for that matter. Um, that said, for many years the industry survived with uh, using integers for everything that was a glyph width, and that's a GDI. And they were able to make that work reasonably well was because uh, Microsoft, they, they, they had really good hinting. Would not work for every single font. They would require the font to have good hinting information. But uh, it worked pretty good. People were happy, at least back then. As, as much as people can be happy, I suppose. Um, so that, let's talk about it. So we have a few techniques to make, uh, to, to get that, that glyph perfectly rendered, right? Um, if you study the problem a little bit closer, well, r roughly is the text too small and the pixel is too big, there are, there's a, a lot of math about um, getting an analog signal that's perfectly curved and you sample that, you have a sample rate it's called the sampling theorem or Nyquist theorem, if you want to Google on that. Um, if you have a very high DPI, like over the 8,000, we will not even be having this talk. Rating tax will be right on. It will be just like the paper. Nobody, nobody cries about the paper, right? Um, so I'm just explaining you guys solution. One solution that's commonly used, very traditionally done on Windows, is hinting. There's a different types of hinting. So what's hinting? Um, it's a very vague and doesn't really mean much, just hint. Um, they basically, they fudge the outline. They move the outline a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right. They make those lines a little bit thicker. Like uh, sometimes with H and you have a crossbar, sometimes that crossbar falls so that it's, it's not nowhere. It doesn't, doesn't, doesn't do any pixels for you. So what they do, they make, th make that crossbar a little bit fat, right? The font design doesn't get happy with you, but what could you do? Not draw anything? Uh, so here is um, a picture I um, borrowed from Microsoft. So you have the at sign, and then you have the at sign on the right. If you look one, the, the one on my right here, y you see that some of the that line is a little bit fatter, right? You can you can see that those the, the thing going around is almost double the size. Why is that? If you look at the image below, you're going to see it. the image below on the left. A lot of the pixels don't even get set. They don't even exist. It, it doesn't resemble the at sign, not even close, right? The one on the right, you, you can get away with that. You know, that, that, that's a huge zoom. Once you make that smaller again, you might just get away just hinting. So hinting is a very powerful technique. I lost no contrast at all. I have black and white. It, it should read just fine. That said, it's hard to do. You know, like, oh, just, just make your outline a little bit bigger. Yeah, right. Um, there are different techniques to do hinting. Uh, the most effective one is uh, from TrueType. Uh, basically, designer himself, he, he writes instructions, say, at that given size, at that given location, you're going to have to change the control points of this curve this much so that this happens. So it can be done manually for each font, for each type size, for each position. Takes many hours, makes developing fonts very expensive. Have you ever gone to buy a font? Have you seen fonts that cost like $600? That sounds insane, right? 
But if you look back, like how much time the guys put in hinting every feature of that font took many, many hours. As a matter of fact, that is a, that is a language that, uh, that they, they developed for you to define that hinting is what they call the bytecode hinting. And your true type actually has a virtual machine that knows how to interpret that bytecode and apply that hinting during rendering. Um, PostScript has, doesn't have the bytecode hinting, but it has a table where there's some information that helps how to change the control points of your splines and bezies. So you can do that. Freescale and uh, I, I can speculate that other rendering like Microsoft and Apple, they also have auto hinting. What if the font doesn't provide any hinting at all? So there are some study to like on the fly produce the hint information to, to correct that. Uh, you're going to compromise the intent. And again, you're going to compromise the li linearity. So again, if you start scaling, things are going to start jumping. They're going to start jumping because they got to fit the pixel grid here and there. Or, or just like the stems or the crossbar in your glyphs are going to you go like 0 0.12, 0 0.13, 14. And if it looks to be going well, then go 14, 14 kind of gives a jump and everything kind of doubles. It is because of that's you're in the next table in your in your font, and that's what the hint and told you to do. And again, so you don't have a nice linear um, projection of your font. So all, all we had here are just workarounds. So the keywords are workarounds and tolerable. They, they are not real solutions. And they might not be tolerable to everybody equally, right? And uh, this uh, Pete Stem, he's um. If you really want to read about that and get scared, you can read a, a web page called Raster Tragedy. Uh, I, I believe he's a Microsoft engineer, and he worked in a clear type rasterizer. So he is, is a pretty good read. A little long though, a little scared too. So JellyFX, the first glyph rasterizer we had came from JDK, AWT, it's uh, T2K. Has anyone ever heard of T2K? It's a pretty old, it's like, um, it's probably from the 90s. It, it's a big part of C code. Um, so when I joined Oracle and started working with text and JavaFX, I had previously worked for, um, for Eclipse Foundation, uh, re rendering text with uh, SWT. And we use rasterizer like GI, GGI Plus, Cairo, Free Type, Core Graphics. I never had heard, I have been doing that for many years, I never heard of T2K. Uh, so for me, it was hard to use T2K. There was no documentation. There was, there was about a couple guys that had been there for 20 years who knew what API was like it. And if you actually go to read the code to try to, to survive, it, that's when you give up. It's just like, you don't want to use it. That said, it isn't bad, it works. You know, it gets the job done. It gets your grayscale, it gets your LCD, it gets your hinting. Uh, I don't believe it gets um, sub-pixel positioning. So, um, okay, that can get a little confused. When I talk about sub-pixel rendering, I'm talking about LCD text. When I'm talking about sub-pixel positioning, I'm talking about the ability of rendering a glyph at a float point location like 1.25, right? GDI don't get that, it's always integers. The whole API only takes the integers and accumulates a lot of error because of those, all those roundings. Um, so back to T2K, uh, you don't get uh, sub-pixel positioning. That said, I, I define a step. We are able to emulate uh, the sub-pixel positioning in our shader when you're rendering LCD text, not grayscale. So grayscale, I, at the end, you are stuck at the integer location all the time. And, and here we have some that goes both ways. So regardless if you draw the text on Windows, Mac, or Linux, it's the same text. It's rendered by the same library. M might be a little different because of your uh, gamma correction. Maybe the calibration of your monitor might look slightly different. But it's the same bitmap. You know, may, maybe the cards are going to have a little variation for different reasons, but it's the same guy. But does not match 
in one if you compare that to other applications on the platform, right? So if you look at the text of a JavaFX application, and any other application on Windows, it's not the same. It's different. It would be different. OK, I'm going to correct that. Somebody looked surprised. Uh, on the Mac, it was particularly bad. On the Mac, it didn't look like Mac not even close. And uh, if, you, if you dare to enable LCD on the Mac, it would look, re re look really, really bad to the point that we disabled. We just didn't do LCD on the Mac. Because it just looked that off. Just it was easier for us to start. We don't have it. They said we have it and look this bad. So that, that was the state of text rendering on the Mac with T2K. Um, on Linux, people were a little bit more flexible because I, I, I don't know, like on, on Mac, people were really fussy about uh, the design and the looks. So a lot of the designers, a lot of guys that really care about every single detail particularly for tax, so we have to do something about it. Another problem is we can we have a license to use it and to distribute it in the binary format. We cannot give the source, um, and that's pretty bad for an open source project where I like be able to give you the entire source tree and you can compile that on ARM7 and have a JFX application running there. Well, without a font rasterizer, that's not going to be a lot of fun, right? Just you could not really port that. So that was a problem for uh, the community and embedded universe. So we we pretty much we moved away from T2K on JavaFX HU40. Um, I think HU20. We are not using T2K anymore anywhere. Uh, Java 8. We used T2K on Linux just because we kind of ran out of time to run all the tests. But right now we don't. We, we have a new font rasterizer in each platform. And if you haven't figured out by now, typography is just really, really hard. And I'm just talking about a few problems that we face. So there's a quote from Jeff Atwood. Um, I used to follow him in his blog called Horror. I stopped, but back in the day it was a lot of fun. I just don't have the time anymore. I don't know. May maybe it's still fun. Uh, so what do we do? So we decided to use uh, the neighbor glyph rasterizer in each platform, right? You know, Windows spent probably a lot, a lot of time to make clear type look good. Mac, equally, they put a lot of energy and money on car text and car graphics. On Linux, they have a free type, which is a great library for that system, or any system for that matter is open source. So um, they, they, they're all pretty good. You know, they, they, they're really what it is for each platform, the really state of the art. Um, so let's look at the Windows. I, I, I did tell a lie a little bit. When I told you that we used T2K on the Windows, we did not, because we knew that T2K to render LCD text on the Windows was not good. So we, are, we were using DDI. And GDI, then, then our JavaFX text would look like native Windows text, which has the characteristics of GDI text. You know, well hinted, nice contrast fonts. Um, and we did the switch that many other uh, products did. We stopped using GDI and we moved to direct write. And that uh, is one of the things that's going to make people sad and other people happy. Uh, because direct write, it, it made the whole Windows rendering of text a little bit different. The, the, it became a little bit more, I, I want to say Mac, but I don't want to that go on the record, but I guess it's too late now. Huh? But but it's not it's not as hinted. It's a little bit more like sub-pixel position. Well, first of all, it is sub-pixel position. It is sub-pixel rendered in... Uh, Personally, looks better for me, um, but some people are not totally happy. It's a, it's a very powerful library. You can really configure a lot of specs about, uh, you, can, you can send in a lot of arguments when you're going to draw your text. Um, I'm just gonna, I, have, I have a little tab table here. This came, came from MSDN. It's just some of the, the things you can tell direct right before you render. So they have entire object that you can configure is the 
write the writer rendering patterns. So the declare type level, it is, I cannot tell you exactly what it is, is a number that is that's probably an input argument for their LCD filter. That's what I think it is, to the best of my interpretation. It, it can control the, the contrast of your text, along with the second one. So the best way of fill that is to get the, the, the clear type, toy, I forgot what's called, tuning toy, and you can play with those options. You can see if your text is going to get a little bit darker, you're going to increase the contrast, or it's going to snap to the pixel a little bit more. You can actually specify your own gamma correction. Um, gamma alone is a pretty bad problem. You know, when you need to do, at, at the end you need to, to, to uh, anyone familiar with the idea of gamma correction? It's like roughly, roughly it's like this. So get a black and white and um, one shade of gray, 50% gray, right? And, and now at the end of the day, you need to come up with a voltage of amount of energy to shoot your pixel to your hardware. So let's say zero volts, black. Uh, one volt, white. You think you're going to put 0 0.5 volts and get gray? No. So there, there, there's like, it, it's a logarithm curve that tells you how, how much correction for, uh, a monitor has to be calibrated, and when, it, when it's well calibrated and you have that calibration information, you have the gamma correction for that monitor. So provide that your OS can give you the correct information for your gamma correction, you can do a good job. Provide that your monitor is well calibrated. I don't want to um, point fingers, but one platform that does best in that is the, is the Mac. It's the only one that you're going to get a more reliable gamma correction. And it's, um, it's, it's going to just change the, 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 the luminosity of your colors. But you need, you need to be like Jasper and be really peak and see that that black's not black, you know. Um, pixel geometry is RGB or uh, R RGB or BGR or, or vertical, right? And the text rendering mode is uh, the most interesting one. So when you're rendering with direct right and you have a customer that really doesn't like it, the default mode of direct right that is sub-pixel position and sub-pixel render text, he can specify GDI classic. And that's going to do the same work that you got. Then you're going to have the same result that you had back in 2005 with GDI. Right on. Right. Uh, you can ask me what I did when I threw out GDI and I put direct right. I just went to the default. You know, like, in that sense, the way I've washed my hands, like, I cannot please everybody. Some people are going to like the GDI look. Some people will like the new look in direct right. I go for the default, and uh, that's what I did. Uh, I'm going to have a buff on Java 1, and we are trying to discuss a little bit. Um, OK, I have no way to control that. There is a way that it can provide some API or some configuration. So you to you know, specify that. Uh, Mozilla had, not, not only Mozilla, uh, a, a, lot, a lot of the browsers, they have that problem. A, a lot of products move from GDI and direct right, and they had customers coming back and said, I don't like your text anymore. And uh, Mozilla added a whole bunch of, uh, oh, it's a nasty configuration file that you can specify all of those. They basically, they, they let you configure all of that. But the most importantly, they allow you to say, rendering mode, GDI classic. And off you go, you have your old look back. Uh, on the Mac, on Mac is a platform that you don't worry very much about text. As, you, as long as you're using Cortex and Core Graphics, you're you are OK. Uh, that said, there are a few configurations. Uh, CG is, is Core Graphics. It's, um, it's how you render with Quartz nowadays. You get a, a Core Graphics context, and you scrape to your uh, surface. So that's some of the, the things you can do with text. Fonts moving can be. Black and white, gray, LCD. Uh, font alias. Um, uh, font moving is black, uh, gray, scale, and, and white. I don't remember. Font alias is, is like nothing. You're going to see all the, the cuts 
all the, the letters. I have a picture of that. And you can have the subpixel positioning. If all subpixel positioning is off, doesn't matter if you're drawing at 0 or 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.9, it always renders the same. Basically, it snaps to the pixel. And subpixel quantization, I'm not sure what it does at the lowest level. The documentation is not very clear. It changes the color of the LCD text a little bit. Um, Linux, uh, free type, FT in there. All, all those names here, if you Google, you're going to find the reference that FT is free type. So you can actually specify your LCD filter. And so you can have none, have the default, which again, that's what I did. I used the default. I didn't particularly tune JavaFX to my very taste myself just because I could have. I just said the default. Uh, and again, you can uh, do a lot of other stuff. Um, LCD and nor normal is grayscale text. Light is lighter grayscale text. Mono is black and white. LCD is subpixel rendering. Another thing is you can do a free type. You can tell it to not to hint. It is like um, you, you can force the uh, free type. They, ha they have their alt hinter, and you can read about it, so you can know what it's doing. You can always force to use that. Use none or use the one, the, the bytecode hinter that is in the font. Um, so I think that pretty much concludes these slides. Then I have a little bit of a demo that I'm going to show you after this. There's a lot of things that I just didn't go in there very much. Um, I, I'm going to start from the bottom and go up. One thing that I get, I get some heat every now and then is kerning. Kerning is... Um, Depending which glyphs you have, you can bring them a little bit closer. Let's say you have a whole bunch of W's and M's or F's and E's or F's and I's. Sometimes you can, you can, you can move the E and the I a little bit closer to the F. So that's kind of it has a little bit of over, maybe in some case overhang over the F. So you can control the spacing of two glyphs based on the kerning pair. So if those, if those two letters make a pair, they're going to current by a certain amount. That information is in a specific table in, um, in, in, in your font file. By default, uh, okay, that's going to sound bad. We don't do any kerning. You're just going to come out and say it. Okay? Uh, why, you can ask. We don't know, don't know how to read a font. No, we do. We have the code. We, we never kind of got around to put the API. But mostly because we got a little bit greedy, and we want to, um, if you, I want to say, uh, advanced typography features, swashes, uh, diagonal fractions, it has a whole lot, is in W3C, uh, I don't know if the draft might, might have been committed already. But the thing is, we wanted to provide you with the entire list of advanced typo typographic features. Right. We d I didn't want to just give you a Boolean API and then later on have to add a whole API that was more co comprehensive. We have the code. Um, the reason it is off by default was just performance. We have a really, really fast path for rendering simple text. And we didn't want to compromise that. If we would go down to r um, render simple text for us, just like when you have I'm sorry, a simple mapping from one card to one glyph. And, you, and you, you see that card, you know the glyph, you know the location of that glyph in the glyph cache, and you know that event, so I already know where to, to draw the next glyph. So we have really put a lot of energy to make that really fast. Once you want to honor, honor girl kerning, and then that cache is not going to be so good anymore. You're going to have to come up for home cache, or just be slow as hell, pretty much. But. Um, we can do it, we have the code in place, and we can do a lot more. We actually can do all the, the, the advanced typographic features. Um, another thing that you need to think about it is about static and dynamic text. Um, so text that is moving in the screen, right, or animating, like scaling, becoming larger or smaller. Right? Like direct write has very specific APIs for you to make that super fast. One thing to know is like rendering text is expensive. Um, and when you are scaling, you are burning your cache because you, you cannot just reuse that image. Because if you, 
if you cache at, at a certain size and then you scale, it blurs. And it blurs a lot and blurs fast and ugly. So you got to render over again. But the thing is, do you really need to do LCD text? If the thing is moving or spinning or rotating? Nobody sees it. Nobody sees it. So that are like uh, another f another thing that people do uh, they, they 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 cache the node they they set the bitmap to to cache and they start from and they don't they they have a can be a little bit blurry they're okay with that and they go from a very small to a somewhat large size and, and it doesn't work at all and I had those bugs coming in sometimes so what happened there first time I ran the text the point size was 0 0.5. The first time I render it, I cache it. And then as that point 0.5 becomes 2, 3, 4, 10, I am expanding, and that's a bitmap, linear expansion, interpolation of something very small to something that will be 20 times that size. So when it expands, it's a big blur. So if you ever need to expand your text or render your text and you want to animate in a scale, make it big first, make the render big first, cache then. And then if you scale down, it looks okay. But if you start small and you scale up, it's gonna blur. If you start big and then you go small, so you start your animation from the big to the small as opposite. And there's like a whole bunch of little games you can play when you're animating your text that makes huge, huge difference on performance. Another problem that we have a glyph cache. So the, the first time you call direct write, renders the glyph, put the glyph in a texture. So a glyph cache thing is, is just, a, just a texture. A texture is just an image that is in, in video memory. So if you saw that glyph again, you need to render again, we just blit from that texture out to the screen, super fast. But if you have a bunch of text scaling, you, you're gonna explode my glyph cache. You're gonna run out of space, you're gonna lose all my glyphs. And the next time the thing starts rendering, you, you're gonna see like performance, okay, 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 dies, slow, 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 fast again. And then when I analyze that, that die, that was when your glyph cache said goodbye. And that next frame that were slow was your glyph cache getting populated again. And then it got good again. E eventually glyph cache, it just repeats itself and keeps going. Uh, memory. Oh, okay, that's, uh, okay. Okay, so Im imagine that you need to save space for in your glyph cache to, sa to save a black and white glyph. How many bytes or bits do you need per pixel? One is either black or white. If you have 20, 255 shades of gray, which is what we do, one byte we will do. If you have LCD text, three bytes per pixel, per glyph, per font, per point size, per transform, LCD, grayscale. So uh, although you're thinking about one glyph using one pixel, each pixel, each glyph is going to be like 8 by 4, 10 by 7, something small, but you can have bigger ones too. So d depending on what you're doing, you, you can be using a lot more memory, and that's memory in the video card. Um, and, and, and that's when you start seeing your, your text killing your performance, which is an embedded. When you don't, or when your small IMAX card, whatever it is, memory is precious. Uh, so it's something that you also need to consider between text and performance. Um, as a matter of fact, in, in JavaFX, if you say your point size, your, your final rendering size of your text is more than 80 pixels, we don't draw as a glyph, using, using a glyph rasterizer. We use the path rasterizer, we draw as a path, and we do not cache. And it's no longer LCD. For one thing, that pixel too big, I don't need many of those before my, 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 my texture, my glyph cache is, is, uh, runs out of space, right? Secondly, at, at that size, LCD is not even that helpful anymore. Um, the last one there, the background is programmable blending. <sighs> um, a, a lot of the time when you do blending, you do, a, you do a blending mode, right? Source over, you know, source minus one, destination, a whole thing. And, and you have a, a lot of 
a blend modes that you can use. When you're doing LCD text, there is nothing you can do. You, you need to do. You need to have a programmable blending. Uh, and so you need to know your destination pixel. You need to know the color of the surface that you are rendering to when you are rendering. Uh, and if you are familiar with uh, the rendering pipeline in GPU, that's a problem. That's a problem because you got to stop the rendering pipeline to read that pixel so that you, you, you can do your own blending yourself. The, the blending equation of LCD tags is quite complicated. Um, and another problem that, that comes from that is that sometimes that destination pixel is not available. That we have a bug, um, it's quite hard to fix technically. That you can be drawing the text to a, to a buffer, to an intermediate surface. You're not drawing to define destination. You're, doing, you're rendering to some catch or some image. And at that point, that image is transparent, so you don't even know what are you blending against. Later on, that image as a whole is going to be blended to the final surface. And that final surface will have your color. But at that time, it was not available to you. So we are going to bail on LCD. And there are some cases that we bail without knowing. So we, uh, we actually run the LCD blending code and it was not LCD. So sometimes you see some very foggy text. It's probably the bug that I have here. Um, canvas is an example. If you drive Canvas, you're going to see that we don't do LCD and Canvas. Just because Canvas, when you create your Canvas, it is transparent. And if you're rendering text to that, I don't know the background to blend against. So when you blend that against your final destination, when the destination color becomes known, uh, then it's already too late. But before I get everybody to sleep, so um, just some references, uh, some of the uh, where, uh, uh, blogs I have read in the past. So just uh, I have a very simple demo. Uh, I was hoping I would have more time to make this um, a little bit more interesting. And they're quite caught there. So I, um, I, I wrote this little app. It's really simple. It doesn't really matter. You put some text there. It is running or it's not running. Oh, sorry. So that's where the text should really be. Uh, what I had though, I have, I have blown the text. So, I, 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 so over here, inside of the red rectangle, I rendered your text. Uh, it's not really cool because we are in a, in a projector and the resolution is super low. So it's, it's hard to judge fine text rendering in this kind of uh, resolution. Um, I, I don't want to just blow like by uh, how many times? Eight times. So each pixel just replicate eight times and I made a big thing of it. So that's, uh, that's what I get rendering text. If you job effects, let me see if I can make this bigger. Uh, okay, so that's grayscale right there, right? It looks a little off. Um, but on the top, that kind of looks nice. And uh, I think this combo here, I'm gonna just move 0 0.1 in the X. And let me see if this text is gonna start dancing a little bit for me. Actually, you cannot see, right? Yeah. Uh, you cannot see on the Mac. O o on Windows, I should have brought my Windows. O on Windows, you're going to see that the distance between the letters doesn't stay the same. Let me see if maybe the text is here. No, okay, I should have had the Windows box. In the Windows box, you can see it right on. Mac is helping me. Um, so one of the things that you will yeah, uh, I play on the one. So other thing I do, like um, I use the snapshot API node to take a snapshot of this node, the text rendering, save to a file, uh, run a whole bunch of tests on Windows. Is that your, the, the, what you, I have there on the right? Uh, run a whole bunch of Linux, uh, run a whole bunch of on the Mac. <coughs> so, um, 
So that's T2K rendering on, on Windows. That's actually GDI rendering on Windows. And down here, I have actually T2K itself, for, uh, I forced the code to use T2K on the Windows for LCD text. And it's pretty close, it's because our, our, our shader that does our LCD for us in JavaFX was really modeled after the Windows clear type LCD filter. Not like the guy that was doing the shader, he was uh, like <coughs> writing the code, he was testing on Windows, so he, he got the Windows down pretty good. Uh, that LCD here, so that's, that's T2K, GDI, and direct write. The DW stands for direct write. And the funny thing is that uh, wh when you look like this, it's like, r really, who cares? It's just like a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit in like, you just really shift the colors a little bit here or there. But, but you have, uh, uh, I think I'm running seven, eight, eight, eight times zoom, maybe, I don't know, my zoom number there kind of flies. But when you scale down, it starts to, to really impact the, um, the contrast. So this one here is uh, using that uh, rendering mode for GDI Classic, which should match right on to that guy here. So if I choose here and I choose here, it's exactly the same. That's, that's actually GDI drawing. And this guy here is direct right dry, dr uh, rendering with GDI Classic. And they do, and they do as they said. They said they're gonna give GDI back and they do. So that's something that we can explore in JavaFX and you can allow people to set a flag somewhere so that he can get GDI back. That one should be the same as this. Yeah, a little bit off. Uh, free type on Linux. Again. So that that's um, free type LCD. Okay, now you can see a little bit of a difference. It starts to get a little bit more noticeable. Free type, you can see you have a little bit of gray on top and on the bottom. That's telling me that they're doing grayscale across the Y, doing their subpixel rendering. And across the X, they're doing LCD. Uh, T2K, on the other hand, it's kind of a little funny, right? It's um, skinny. Uh, and now here, I'll, I'll play a little bit with the filters, the LCD filters in f uh, free type. It allows me to set that. None. So like, anyone surprised by that? It's actually technically correct. If you just oversample your, uh, your, your, your pixel, and then you downsample, you're really gonna get things like red and greens and yellows because uh, the RGB pixels are like, well, decided, well, you're always gonna be mixing shades of those three primary colors and you're gonna get secondary colors maybe. So those are secondary colors. Makes sense, right? You are not doing a low pass filter to remove the, the, the color fringes that people, some people don't like in LCD text. That said, they have the filters. Right, I use the default filter. I use that, which should probably be that, yes. The legacy one doesn't seem to me do much of a good job. And then they have a light option. That kind of looks okay. I think it's light when you're compared to the default, right? So if you go here, the colors are a little bit lighter. So I guess you just lost a little bit of contrast in there. Okay. Now, now it's a little bit more fun. Mac. So that's T2K on the Mac. That's the real one on the Mac. When, when you get that in real text size, it makes a big difference. The grayscale is not a big deal. Grayscale is just like a little bit different. Uh, here I play a little bit with some of the options. Let me see if I can read that. Launch aliasing off. 
right, you get alias text. You're not doing any subpixel. You're not doing any fonts moving at all, right? It's just like black and white, bam. Uh, this one here, th this one here is the same as the free type, right? It just, it, 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 didn't, it didn't do the, the, the LCD filter. I mean, it, it, it did the grayscale, but it didn't do the, the la. It, it did so pixel, but it didn't do anything after that. So you get you, you, you have a mix of the primary colors in the worst case scenario, right? So you can only end up with secondary colors in your color wheel. This is what the text should really look like on a Mac. Which is a little bit different than what we do. Which I, I, I really wish we could be here, where every pixel is rendered in its proper sub pixel position. And what this is happening is because of memory. I'm trying to save memory. I know that I can sample my pixel one time and have one picture of the letter A, let's say. And then I can try to use the distribution of energy in my shader program to give me 0, 0 0.3, 0 0.6. So that give me three subpixel positions. Um, or I can take, th or I can call Cortex and take three pictures of that and pay the, pay the price and use the memory three times over. And then I would have 100% native text uh, rendering on the Mac. That would look like that, so which should match any other text on the platform. But I, I, uh, I'm getting this, and I'm paying a third of the memory, so it felt like a good trade-off. That said, again, so a, a lot of the options that uh, that I show you here, they could have been exposed through APIs for for designers or people that really care about text rendering. And I have no idea how I'm doing on the time. Am I good or I'm going over? Okay, I'm good. All right. So, uh, and, and actually, this pretty much brings to the end. So, during the buff, uh, actually, I don't remember right now when is the buff. It was really about like a, a little bit same of the ideas between direct write, free type, and core text, what you can configure, how you render your text, and how we can expose that as an API. So, I know. I know that some people like to see this GDI Classic. I would like to see that. I also think that this is kind of an interesting option. And then there's also options to control hinting that I didn't, didn't explore over here. All right. So that's um, all I got for you. In a if anyone has questions, what is my yes? So yeah, I'm done here with my slides and with the quick demo. Questions? It's more of a complicated, different. All right, so I have, I have a suggestion. I don't have a question. <laughs> sure, good <laughs> enough. So for your for your Java one talk, it would yeah. be cool if your demo app would do like side by sides between a couple of the options. Yes, um, and I think you have the vertical real estate for that. Like this thing here, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No. Um, I had a lot of ideas how to make the little toy. I never quite <laughs> had the time to finish. Like playing with toys uh, is fun, but it's, um, as far as I got this time, but hopefully for by Java one time frame, I will be yeah. able to put them side by side. No, it's a suggestion for Java one. Yeah, I'll get there. And I also want to draw the pixel grid because sometimes it really helps to see what's happening. Yeah, that would be. But I think it's kind of grid. obvious at that scale what the pixel grid is. I mean, I yeah, don't know. It yeah. might look okay. I, I, I guess at that size. All 
All right, so while, while I was stalling for time, did anyone come up with a great question? This is like a, a text geek session. So say something to Carl, Raj. You guys have been chatting on <laughs> over. Um, so we're out, we were chatting with Carl over um, the uh, online chat. He's um, author of one of the other JavaFX books. And he's thinking of coming out and presenting around Java one time frame if we can arrange it. So we might swizzle our dates to accommodate Carl. And you had some other ideas, right? Not too close to your mouth. <coughs> um, a widget FX, I was looking into it because uh, uh, Steve started uh, widget FX long back in the time of uh, Java FX script. Then later, uh, no one have touched that because Java FX 2.0 started. After that, the uh, only guy who started, I see it, is uh, Call, uh, who is working on eWidget FX. So I joined and I working on him, working on his project and improving it. I was just, just, just chatting with him to make sure that we'll have one session with him here. Another project, he also working on something called uh, FX Playground, which is currently with him. It is not yet open sourced. So that is another one which he can give a demo here on that one. Cool. And maybe in J Rebirth as well. So you gonna you gonna come back out for Java one, Raj? Um, maybe. Maybe. All right. Any questions for our illustrious presenter? Comments? Suggestions when he gives the same talk at Java one? get the slides uh, on the it's oh, oh okay yeah, okay yeah yeah the mic is smaller <laughs> um, yeah hopefully the slides will be available at our site uh, I'm not sure for the program that you demoed uh, you know uh, is this like available as a source code or because you you have like three libraries to play with right and I'm not sure if uh, if you can you know, just distribute that, or um, I can I, I can probably put in the toys repo at some point. Okay. Uh, if if you don't, if you if you um, clone our tree, we have a bunch of toys. You know, if you if you get our source and you poke around, you're gonna find a folder. I think it's called toys. I can I can probably put in there. That's another. Yeah, let me see. It might be of interest to somebody you know, to play yeah. with. Yeah, hey, right there. So if okay, you get our so three, you're going to find apps. Then you're going to have the good stuff. Hey, Keith, can you switch to his desktop? Oh, uh, OK. Wonderful. Okay, so you are looking there. RT is the the, 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 the the top level folder, right? So if you come down to modules, that's where you get the code, right? That's the code for graphics and controls. The modules are going to be our jigsaw module at some point. But if you come over here in apps, you're going to find a whole bunch of good stuff. Um, there's a whole bunch of actually really well done little toys for you to, to, ha to have fun with. Uh, a 3D viewer, Ensemble, the, the, the Modena app. You have a bunch of little games. In the last time I played with them, they were working well. Uh, the conference schedule app that was uh, in the kiosk two years ago in Java 1 is a kind of a fun app. Some fun stuff in there. And then you found some really simple applications just to illustrate one feature. Toys is where to go. And take a look. And uh, hello, more specifically, you're gonna find a bunch of those. You, you guys, link yeah. Are you guys familiar with the OpenJFX repo? Uh, it's under OpenJDK. Well, I'm, yeah, mm. I went to OpenJDK, but 
I'm not sure if we can maybe just uh, post the link to this uh, to the top level. Okay, we can put something in the meetup comments. Yeah. Sure, yeah. Okay. So, so anyway, you're like gonna find little things like this, hello, area chart. And that's just like a very simple program that okay. teaches how to use an area chart. And it goes on for a whole bunch of different ones. So we have a lot of those little snipped codes, small codes to teach one particular function. And then you have the fancy ones too. Okay. So I can, I can probably Sneak in there and put the code in there. Yeah, yeah just dump it in. Nobody will notice. <laughs> okay, so any other questions? I was looking at J Latex math. Uh, it looks kind of interesting. I don't know if you have anything to say about that. I don't know. All right, anything to say about. I'm sorry, I, I, J Latex math? I'm not familiar with the name. J. Okay, so it's latex stuff. Latex formulas. It would be nice if it was part of standard Java FX APIs. But I guess it's a separate project. So. Yeah, I don't know. I never never played with the library. Can take a look. Yeah. Or maybe just get them to do a version <laughs> for Java <laughs> FX. Well, I think it does work with. Java FX, but it's a separate project. All right. So we need to give away an IntelliJ license. Um, oh, and we should probably close out the online stream. So for folks who are hanging out online, thanks very much for joining the presentation. Um, yeah, um, I would like to thank everybody for coming. Everybody in the, 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 on the internet, Steve for an opportunity to <laughs> come out of my cubicle and see people. <laughs> that was good. Um, and I, I want to just you know, uh, show you guys maybe not a lot of things that might be able to apply or might be important for you using JFX, but there's a lot of interesting concepts that uh, I think is important to every developer to know a little bit. You know, you don't need to be a master in hinting, but know what it is, know what a sub-pixel rendering is, how to oversample and downsample uh, a sample of um, the rate. So, you know, good to have an idea what you're talking about, even though you just have a slight introduction. So that was uh, my intent, to give you a little introduction to those topics for those you maybe never heard of. And don't worry, in JavaFX, uh, the graphics, the guys down in graphics, they are doing the, great, the, math, the craziness, the math there. So most of the time, people don't need to worry about that stuff. Cool. All right, so round of applause for Felipe. Thank you, guys. And um, I'm also doing a broadcast tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. We're going to do a lab with Reza. So this isn't a, a physical meetup. It's a at-home or from your work meetup. But if you're interested, from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Pacific time tomorrow, we're going to have a JMS2 lab with Reza Rahman. Um, and that'll be on the Night Hacking website if you go to nighthacking.com. Okay, so Keith, kill your kill the stream before we do the sunspot and the IntelliJ license, or I guess I'm gonna do it.